everyone and welcome to what's doing the podcast where we delve into the fascinating world of media and entertainment i'm abed your host and today we are joined by two remarkable figures from the malaysian creative scene emilia roslan and steven lim from view malaysia emilia as the director of production and steven director of content development have brought to life some of view's most captivating series their work includes hits like from saga with love she was pretty and the much talked about adaptation of the korean drama w2 worlds their efforts have reshaped how malaysian audiences consume drama and have set new industry benchmarks today we are set to explore the behind the scene magic of these productions discuss the challenges of creating compelling content and understanding views vision in the competitive landscape of ott platforms so without further ado let me welcome emilia and steven from view thank you so much you guys for for coming for this uh, podcast thanks for having us abit so uh, i think uh, the biggest question at this point of time is uh, i saw the shows last year uh, saga from saga with love and and you know uh, and also nenek bogok tiga yeah and uh, i quite like that because uh, the, both of them were nicely produced shows uh, thank you and what was the strategic approach behind choosing titles like uh, saga and and nenek uh, for the views of audience so what we do is when we construct our slate for the year right it's always about you know, what can we what's the variety of offerings that we can offer to our viewers we do know that certain genres resonate better rom-com is evergreen right romance dramas that always works uh, thrillers particularly thrillers with a supernatural element so based on that right i mean the decision then to do something like nenek bongko tiga you know a uh, supernatural dark fantasy thriller um alter narrative which was the next one after that which was also a thriller but with a uh, sci-fi elements uh thrillers again is something that works for our audience then rom-com uh, that was saga and then w which was a romance fantasy uh thriller right yeah i was going to come to w so i think it was very well uh, produced show so congratulations on that thank you can you share the experience of adapting she was pretty well i would say that it was an easy right um we do have the um, how to say that we do have the existing audiences for the original k drama she was pretty right same goes to w2 also every time we decided to do um to take or to select um any foreign titles for us to do the adaptation into malaysia version um i would say we're always careful with the selections uh because um we always wanted to localize it as much as possible but you know how korean dramas are right i mean they 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 were really proud of their own culture and so on so we need to adjust that uh into our own malaysian versions so yeah i i i i would say it wasn't easy but in the meantime it was interesting for us to adapt <laughs> it's like uh trying to trying to think or trying to expect uh what the audience would want to to see in in our version right yeah yeah so can you walk us through the creative process of adapting w2 worlds so i i guess it starts off uh, i mean first of all was how do we even land on that right uh, so in this case here um because we carried the korean original right we i mean view made its name by first uh, being one of the first to market with korean dramas So we have uh we have our own internal data you know shows that have done well shows that have resonated particularly well with audiences um previous adaptations are like black she was pretty w these the originals were all hugely popular on korea i mean on uh, on view so we knew that there was already an inbuilt fan base there right say right there are these are shows that have worked for our view audiences so that's a good starting point we then also look in terms of when we take these shows right uh trying to identify what was it that made the original a success 
because some shows are very very cast driven yep right uh, some of the other korean dramas uh, would not necessarily an adaptation would not necessarily work in malaysia because of that very specific setting or the time period the koreans do a lot of period pieces yeah. as well right yeah. so then for us after we look all right shows that have done well on view then after we look look challenges to adaptation right how much of this can we uh, can we look can we transfer the appeal right into for the malaysia setting uh, then after that would be how do we then localize it right how do we put our mark on it while essentially maintaining uh, the essence of the story so what we eventually did with w was uh, the original w is actually 16 episodes we went with the we went with the decision to make it as 12 episodes because uh, again a, a format that the koreans like doing the story does have room to meander which our audiences don't naturally go for that. So it was decided we'll make it tighter, more compact. We maintain key beats, uh, we consolidated characters, but we also knew, for example, that they were characters in the original, that in the local setting, we can give them more airtime. And that was actually where the Elizabeth Tan and Miro Ayman characters, yeah. which are much more expanded. So that's really what drives us when we go into development, right? And then, once you're done, we hand over to production. So how do you ensure with all these adaptations, Korean adaptations which you do, is how do you ensure that the the essence of the story remains with uh, and, uh, you know, while infusing local flavors in that? Okay, I think that is depending on what kind of scripts that we got, right? From, from Steven and the team and also the writers. Uh, and and next is also for us because because at view right um, we always work together with the producer, uh, the director and also the cast right. Uh, the pre pro that we went through, uh, I would say was quite strong, um, especially during Chaos Pretty and and W Two Worlds right. We always have um, a discussion with the director. What are the changes that we should make? And what are uh, the the things that we should maintain, uh, so it won't be too far from the original uh, K drama. So really, when we when we look uh, at adapting shows, right? Um, and when once we look at the data, we say, all right, these are shows that have worked well for us. It's then about trying to drill down. What was it about that story that worked well? Um, sometimes it's cast. Uh, but other times it's because there's a great high concept, which was the case with W, right? Uh, they had a great high concept, uh, girl from the real world meets boy from the comic world. And then the, it becomes a question about how relevant would this be to our audience? So that meant like, you know, is there a comic reading culture here? Fortunately, there is. Uh, fortunately, there is. Um, so we knew that, look, it's something that our audiences would be able to, to get, right? It's relevant. Uh, then we look thematically, right? Are the themes of the story, Let's search for the quest, the hero's quest for justice, uh, for revenge, uh, the girl driven by, you know, wanting to save, wanting to save the guy. Uh, these were all things as well that we knew would resonate with our audiences. So with that in mind, then the next thing was, okay, we these are the things that we need to preserve. Now, how do we then bring this over to our Malaysian version? And herein was where we knew, because the comic world is like a fantasy world yep. anyway. If you watched it, it looks like it's set in generic modern yeah. city, right? Uh, but outside in the real world, it's KL, right? So in terms of that shows up in the locations as we wrote it, uh, it shows up very much in the dialogue. Yeah. Whereas in the comic world, they tend to speak with sort of more Bahasa Baku. Yeah. Whereas once in the real world, it becomes the language, the dialogue becomes more colloquial because that's how Malaysians speak. So that was one way we saw of, uh, that was one way we saw of doing it. Uh, and then really, I would say that you kind of take it from there in terms of when you grow the characters, right? Relating it to bits like Izara, which is Diane Trisha's character, yeah. right? Her growing up, her references, her pop culture references, all very much refers to things that happen in Malaysia. And that's how we try to do that localization. 
सकती एंड दैट्स बीन डन क्वाइट वेल एक्चुअली यू नो दैट्स वन ऑफ द रीजंस व्हाई इट बिकम्स मोर यू नो द ऑडियंसेस आर कनेक्टिंग विद द शो या अ लॉट विद सो मेनी के drama has been adapted in malaysia what does the future of k drama adaptations in malaysia look like hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um i'll 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 go first i think certainly in terms of what because what we are also seeing right um k dramas have evolved quite a fair bit in fact i would say if you look at she was pretty uh, that the original came out i think it's 2015 yeah. thereabouts right yeah. uh, w was 2016 2017 also thereabouts so back then there was when uh, shows were still doing the full 16 the full 16 episodes uh, stories had room to meander and all but we're also seeing that the new k dramas that are coming out they are much more they are more focused on compact story storytelling mm-hmm. uh, that's also because of the rise of otts yep. right um, that uh, they are much more focused on compact storytelling there is no longer that room to sort of meander um, i i like to say that sometimes you watch a lot of the older k dramas yeah around episode 3 or 4 there's a sudden genre shift <laughs> yes it suddenly becomes something else it suddenly becomes yeah. something else right uh, which we're seeing um, we're seeing less of that now because viewers like tighter adaptations and i think also the i guess the risk with doing adaptations like this is always assuming that it will work hmm. um because one thing we we find right when malaysians watch it uh malaysians because we consume content from all around the world we're used to reading subtitles yeah. right to hearing different languages because of that we tend to also evolve different benchmarks right that when you watch a korean drama that you have a you have put on a different cap you judge it differently uh then if you were to do it uh if you were to see the same thing but done malaysia which is why we also try to be sensitive right to like how do you localize some of these elements so i guess moving forward uh in terms of the future adaptations uh, i think adaptations uh, there is still very much a place for that uh on our slate uh but because of how the stories are evolving uh, i think that you know we our, we ourselves need to be developing our own sense our own sense of storytelling so that uh, when the time comes you know we can say look these are our shows these are our stories right and maybe someone wants to adapt ours instead yeah and also there's a lot of data which 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 comes with each show and i think it it also tells a story of how the viewers uh, you know uh, interest are uh, changing from what kind of stories to what kind of stories so i think it'll be easier in the future to pick up those stories which which matches those numbers yeah i think that that can be one way mm. to move forward uh what challenges do you face in producing these premium drama series in the competitive ott space oh well, there are a lot of challenges um i think in malaysia it, it's not a it's not a huge problem per se but it is still a problem or or that becomes a challenges for productions right where we feel that the talent pool in malaysia isn't big enough yeah and then in malaysia itself there are a lot of otts besides a uh, view right and even um other broadcasters the traditional broadcasters has uh, oh, they also have their own ott and they also um now are producing premium content so we every time we wanted to activate production um we always um have an issue to lock the cash ods the key cast or even the supporting cast for each project right we always have the problem to to get the people that we wanted uh so that's how i feel that that you know our talent pool in malaysia is in big enough but i think um at some point we manage to to you know we, we manage to fix that um number one um maybe we 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 try to plan ahead like much mo- mo- a few months way in advance and also uh, build our own relationship besides um depending on the producer the production house itself we ourselves will try to build our own networking our own relationship with these people either the cast director his ods and even the producers itself right so that will be um i would say that the relationship that the, the networking that we have 
help us to get the people that we wanted because it's like you know then then for from view itself they have me and steven to talk to person a for example and we have the production companies itself right the producer itself or maybe the director itself to talk to person a so that shows how important these people are how important this person is to the project and somehow it looks like oh um a view and the production companies are very uh, united and together to get this person for example uh and then i think um after one or two years you know um steven and i uh, started looking after development and production of the view originals for more than 12 months right now right for more for more than 12 months more than a year right so starting uh, started uh with that i think we have uh, consistently um come up with uh, a view original series we have consistently produced from one project to another where it helps us for other people even the cast the show this and even the director right look at us as a serious platform who wanted to do premium premium series so when we when we decided to do um a few projects and we when we decided to talk about it um to the external parties they know that okay this is going to happen right okay view is so serious uh they know uh they know when they wanted to shoot when they wanted to start the development or production and when they wanted to tx the show so i think that consistency helps us to get um this talent and having means taking on from there because uh, we talk to a lot of you know industry people and they have such great things to talk about you guys that you guys are so planned you guys are you are so on the ball and i uh, get things done and uh, so yeah means you guys are doing a fantastic job by the way uh, so how pressure. does <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all uh, how does view stands out among the local content players in creating great stories by being consistent <laughs> no, that's one yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah. that's one see and apart from that means picking up great stories also yeah right? well i think one of it also is um being being certain mm-hmm. about the sandbox that we want to play in right uh because we know for example that our value proposition is that we create a uh, premium dramas um and in that space there are not many players that do there are not many players that do premium malay dramas yeah. so that's already in terms which means in terms of um the sophistication of the, of the storytelling uh in terms of the production values that we bring these are things that differentiate us mm. uh one of the other things also is also knowing is also knowing our audience sensibilities you know so sort of where where you sit on the spectrum i guess between the mass the uh the mass audience as well as the urban uh audience and knowing that and f being certain about that sweet spot that we want to operate in so once we know these things right then it's with those filters we go is this story going to be something that these people would watch uh so it's having that sense you know and then of course once you once you've agreed on that then in terms of how do you craft a story the story structure i mean that is a tried and true path that has already been done by hollywood and all of the other larger industries right so then there is a template there that we can follow but it starts with you know knowing what your knowing who your audience is knowing what they want to watch I like to add that you know we when we launch our series right we follow um the comments the feedbacks on social media quite seriously so that's how um besides looking looking at the data on our own platform we also check on 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 those comments on on social media for us to know them better right so so based on that also that 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 comment um those feedback help us to also understand their appetite on on the content on our platforms or maybe um also the content that they're looking for not just looking at our platform maybe they also look at the other platforms as well right so i guess those those feedbacks the social media help us quite a lot um for us to give them or to feed them with a more uh, great and interesting content i think that's a great soundboard you know to yeah. get all yeah. those comments in and and implement that in the next next project uh 
picking up to what you were talking about the 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 sh- small talent pool which we have uh, and we all go through that and uh, i know at one point of time it's always this whole tussle of getting the best hudies for the show and how is view addressing the talent shortage in in malaysia's creative industry be more open try to work with uh, newcomers or up and coming cast mm-hmm. talent and also try i would say try to to be a bit more open by working with the new uh, even a crew itself right like the the image and styling team a director production designer uh, assistant director you know all these hods right we um we would like to try these new people because i believe that out there even though if uh, even when you look at their profile their portfolio right they might not they might haven't done so much premium contents or even uh, feature films but maybe there's something in their past work that that can can convince us that these people can actually do premium contents it's just that they don't have the opportunity yet, yet right so uh, that's how we we try to manage the problem of the talent pool shortage Yeah, I, that's great, and I think that is needs to be seriously addressed at this point of time because I know there have been cases when even we 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 get into that space where we are working and the the kind of people we want we don't get. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I can give you an example. Um, when we have Datuk Yusri Abdul Halim for for Ganjil, I think for the first time, uh, we we work with Datuk Yusri uh, for View, right? So he. before he worked with us he uh, he has worked with this one the op irwan munir uh, for a few uh, tv dramas it's just a normal tv dramas right uh, so he told us that he wanted to work with this the op uh, he is aware that irwan munir hasn't done any premium content yet at that time but he's confident that that uh, he can work well with uh this dop and then give us something new for the for the for our own series right so that's how we we try to work with more uh, new people and then and then i believe that you know with the combination with you know a uh, one experience um hit and then with another one a new hit that might help and also will give us more options in the upcoming uh, project perfect i think i hope that works because that is the current need of the hour well actually uh, if if i can add to that as well right because now say talking from the development perspective yeah. as well because that's also where one of the shortages is right uh the difficulty in finding trained writers and i think that's also how we have set how we have tackled that is that we have a pipeline in place we have a playbook There is a playbook, you know, that says this is what we need to do for development. This is what we need going into production and all that. Uh, and the idea behind having this established process is that it tries to account for the fact that the people working in it, the people, the talents that we use, levels of experience may differ, levels of expertise, exposure may differ. But by having this baseline uh, process, right, the pipeline then is. what at least gives you an operating system a, a way to we are going to do this 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 you have your writers rooms we go through outlines this is how we note the outlines this is what we look for heading into scripts this is where we now shift the focus this is the checklist of things we look for i won't say that it is about f- applying formulas to storytelling rather it's having a pipeline that has been battle tested that we know works and using that pipeline as the guide because then that at least sort of assures that everyone is there is a standard operating procedure there do you mind sending one one of those manuals to us <laughs> <laughs> we will we'll try to follow that uh but great going i think that's that yeah. sets the the tone for any production and i think going forward we can increase this talent pool if we work like that mm-hmm. So how do you balance the creative vision with audience expectations in your series? Can I take that? <laughs> Give me a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um I guess we I I mean when you say audience expectations or at least say going by feedback the the consistent feedback that we get uh then we see on social media you know people will say like oh Kalochi's Twitter views money must be best 
right? Mm -hmm. The expectation is just simply that audiences have come to expect quality from us. They know that when a view original goes up, uh, real thought, real effort has gone into that. So for us, it is about not taking shortcuts in developing the story, in producing it. But in terms of what kind of stories, you know, that's again, just, just driven by, all right, this is our understanding of what the audience looks for, right? But we don't specifically start off with, people are going to love this and, you know. No, but then again, you guys have set a bar. So yeah. I think uh, expectation-wise, that's, that's where the audience is one. Okay, if, if when you're switching on view, you will get this level of quality, this level of storytelling. And that's why I think that's that, that bar has to be met. So I think... <laughs> No, no pressure. <laughs> so I think that's that's how, uh, from a viewer perspective, I think that that that's how it works. Uh, so how do genres like like Sribunina and Ijab uh, Kaput and Hilang and Nenek Bongotiga contribute to views overall strategy while being the key factors behind view success in winning local and global awards? I, w I always want to say that whatever that we do, story first, right? Story comes first. Uh, even every time people approach us, um, you know, when, when people approaching us, like wanted to send us something and whatnot, I always remind people that look, story first, story first, story first, right? No matter what kind of genre that we're doing, I do believe that the story must fit, must fit the, the, the audience need. Right, uh, and and it has to be relevant to the audience. It has to be easier for the audience to to feel for it, to fall for it, right? Uh, and once we have this story, right, once we believe that okay, this story works, and then that's when uh, we need to focus on the prep, on the productions to make sure that which is that is the pressure on my part, right? When Stephen handed over the best story to me, then I was like, mm, how can I do this within the budget that I have, right? And then how can I push the producers, the production houses, the team to give us um, the best quality out of the best that they can give it to us. So that's when uh, us and our team itself contribute uh, to this because we, like I said just now, we always work together with the production team. We always work together with the producers. We always check on, on every, uh, well, not always check, but you know, on all key things, we always check and then, and our, it's like it's like an accounting things, right? We do uh, check and balance. So we, I always wanted to make sure that the producers give justice to the story yeah. because these people have spent, what, four to five months to no, get us the story, right? So we need to make sure that we visualize it properly because I think for us to go to any awards, we need to make sure that these two things uh, blend well. You know, these two things, um, um, uh, um, you know, complement each other. Because if you get, if you have good stories, but the production is just so-so, or you know, you you didn't really um, you you or you took it easy uh, on productions, it won't work. Um, let's say if you didn't really focus on the performance, that might not work, right? It's just a waste to, to have these great stories on the table and then you didn't get the right performance. And and if you have great productions, but the story is just so-so, it's it's also the same. So that's why I, I always feel that story first, okay, give us the best story that you can give and then let let's the pressure, the stressful becomes ours. <laughs> It's, it's good to have the balance, you know. He takes the uh, you know pressure for five months, <laughs> and then passes yeah. on to you. Yes, yeah. And, and I, I would, but I was, I would also add that um, the awards that we have been fortunate enough to win have come as a consequence of you know just trying to get out the best product uh, possible. It's not from a strategy to we are going to specifically target to win these awards. I mean, like Emilia says, the story first, the product comes first. Uh, awards, if we are lucky enough to win them, comes as a consequence of that. But it's not the end goal. Yeah. Switching gears here. And uh, how do you integrate brand sponsorships uh, into your series without compromising on the creative integrity? That's his job. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
that's actually something that we feel strongly about. Uh, you know, that yes, you could have uh, placement, you could have integration, but anytime it is in your face, it feels force, uh, you know, it, it just brings the whole story to a screeching halt, right? It becomes repulsive. Yeah. So our thing has always been, how can we, how can we adapt it or how can we build it into the story uh, in the way that is organic? And I think like, you know, there are, I mean, the couple of ones that we're still really proud of, uh, we did, uh, she was pretty, Sun Silk, right? Whereby the shampoo itself was built into that store, it was built into the storyline. And the thing is that throughout the entire show, you only mentioned the name Sun Silk once. And even then, we figured out a way to make it work into the story because you had the Hanif character, you know, who recognizes the smell of the shampoo and he just asks, you know, what's, what's that? What brand? Because I've smelled it on someone else before. So we worked that in, but that's the only time you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the name. Everything else has always just been, you see it, they talk about, oh, we're out of, we're out of shampoo but you just need to show it, right? Mm -hmm. So the, for us, the key has always been just how can we integrate this, uh, this, these things uh, into the story in a way that it just feels like, oh, by the way, you know? And that's how it should be, actually. If you're going to force feed the audiences, they are going to just say, oh, okay. You'll be turned off. Yeah, there's a there's big turn off. Yeah. These days, yeah, you have to be very sensitive <laughs> not to... So, Everybody wants to yeah. comment on social media, yes. right? So, yes. Yeah. See, um, I mean, we and we do push back uh, sometimes. Yeah. You know, they are they are requests. Sometimes they say, "Can you, can you do this?" And we, oh, but you do this, it becomes a uh, two. This whole scene becomes a commercial, yeah. right? So we push back on it. And I think we've been fortunate that you know so far the proof is in the pudding. I think the first time we did Sun Silk thing, you know, the the internet went wild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we and loved then, it. but uh, before we get to productions. There was a lot of pushback. I remember back then where, you know, the clients wanted this way and then we tried nicely. <laughs> we, we, we pushed back nicely yeah. and then trying to convince them that, look, this is, you know, the best way uh, to, to do the product placement, the product integration. And yeah, I guess we, we were lucky enough where, yeah. uh, you know, when, when the scenes went viral, which we didn't expect it to be like that, right? <laughs> But that's that. That's yeah. what clients want. That's what brands want. Yeah. That things yeah. go viral. Yeah. I Means uh, I think they only understand once they see what's been done. Yeah. And on Correct. paper or as well as, as a discussion, I don't think they yeah. can figure out how how it will be done. So yeah, kudos to that sun silk that that became viral. But taking that to the next question is that what role does viewer feedback play in shaping future? view originals so I'm mm, yeah. um, I think for us it's uh, viewer feedback uh, feedback on social media it's it's useful just to ensure that we're not operating in an echo chamber uh, because the, the danger of course right is after a while we you know we're an OTT platform we've got all of these data we are constantly parsing through all of this and become shocks in the real you yeah. The danger is when we think we're the smartest people in the room. You've seen that happening in the industry <laughs> before. <laughs> right? So for, for us, um, having, that, having that feedback is certainly useful as, as a check and balance because we are sometimes surprised, right? Sometimes, like, oh, this wasn't quite what we thought. Sometimes it validates uh, assumptions that we've been operating under. Other times it has challenged those assumptions, you know, and that's always a good thing. Right, because it, it keeps us on our toes. It's always a good thing because then also the uh, viewers will have that you know uh, that two way communication that yeah. what we wanted we got it. Yeah. It means it made sense what I said was taken into consideration and and been yeah. implemented. So I think it's uh, from a viewer perspective also because they are paying customers and I think their 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 word holds water you know so yeah. great. So this question I wanted to ask you guys for a very long. The view of France means what started off and what it has become is now the talk of the industry. That view of France is something we the whole industry look forward to. Are you sure? Yeah, it does. And we, just, we just had it twice. We done it twice. <laughs> no, trust me, from where it started and what it yeah. happened last year, end of, end of last year, I think 
everyone was talking the internet was ablaze with great pictures and um, amazing performances mm-hmm. and and uh, and no and you guys are killing it year after year so what is the strategy behind the upfront and how does this great on ground investment pays off first thing the main objective of having that that view upfront is for us to push the brand right for us to to um to bring the brands um to the audience audience out there to you know and uh, number 1 and and then now number 2 is for us to announce our upcoming slate so that is i guess that is our main objective of having that view up front um but i'm not sure what are people it, it's just so so <laughs> glitzy it's so glamorous yeah. it's so you know yeah so is this is, is it just the glamorous or it, you know it's become the met gala of broadcast now <laughs> well I, <laughs> so i i mean i would actually that that i mean all credit uh you know to our marketing team yeah. uh you know our marketing team led by Eric Xiu and Shahida Azad uh who came up with the idea because actually the term upfront itself used overseas upfront yeah. is a term just mean this is a preview of yeah. what's coming up yes. yeah it's just that like over here in malaysia no one used that term yeah. so marketing uh made the decision you know let's no one's using it let's co op that term right mm-hmm. we are calling it the upfront um and as emilia said right it's just re- this is our chance to give you a preview for what's coming up so it gets the audience excited it gets cast excited after that you know we have cast contacting us say oh my god i want to be part of this show yeah. right and it gets that's what we both want there yeah. <laughs> out right. of our friend yeah. no but it, it 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 managed to do that and mm-hmm. the, the whole social media was a blaze for a few days where everybody was showcasing them being there all the technicians were there all the talents were there yeah. and uh, i was really excited although i'm sorry i couldn't come because i was traveling at that point of time yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i know i, I was traveling i was in and i was in makka yeah. so i i couldn't come but yeah. uh, congratulations for for pulling off such a great feat and uh, it looks like uh, you know any anything which can be done in the west has been done here yeah well i mean credit for that really goes to our marketing team uh, for for putting on a very very slick production We just go up on stage. We we say what we're told to say. We do what we're told to do. Yeah, we just went to the rehearsals. <laughs> they they scheduled for us, and then you know, okay, this is script. Well, the script was prepared by Steven, so I I just read it. <laughs> oh, I remember you know? because uh, first of all, I was not there, and I really wanted to come mm. that one. But maybe next time, uh, I will I will definitely <laughs> be there. So. Can you share the insights into views upcoming projects uh, and what audiences can expect? Okay, we we've announced it at the upfront recently. <laughs> well, I was not there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So for 2024, uh we do have uh, a few titles. Um the first one will be Telanjur Cinta, uh which is Emma Fatima's debut on the on the on OTT, OTT platform. Uh, that was Emma's Fatima's idea, and Telanju Chinta is our first view original that will be TX will be launched during Ramadan. We've never had um, our titles during Ramadan, so for DC we just wanted to do something new, yeah. right? So we just wanted to try uh, to try out uh, what kind of feedback, uh, what kind of uh, viewers that we gonna have when we launch our Malay dramas, our our very own view original during Ramadan. And then next, the uh, next will be Nasu, Nasu. Uh, who is which is directed by Sain Kutsi. Uh, Sain directed, uh, Sain co-directed uh, Black season two and Hilang with Gus Abu Bakar in the past. So this is his first um, single directing uh, uh, show with us. Uh, Nasu is uh, produced by Infinitus Productions. Gaya. Um, yeah, which is under Gaya. Uh, and then the next one will be Gadis Master. Okay, Gadis. I would say that Gadis Master is a bit uh, is is a quite interesting project. Remember, just now we talk about um, um, a shortage, uh, talent pool shortage, and all right. And they wanted to try out uh, uh, a newcomer, uh, potential uh, young uh, directors, producers. So Gadis Master is one of it. So we we always wanted to try uh, a new producers or young talent. that we see potential in them so we got uh this production company Cinemalaya Studios 
they have RB, RB Roseland as a producer and then Yusuf uh, as a director. So we are working with them right now. We are in, in pre-production uh, right now for Gadis Masa, where we feel that this, this story or this project might be the perfect ones for us to try work with uh, uh, new people. Uh, and of course, uh, we try to to mix it with uh, an experience HOD for, for Gadis Masa, just to fit with the new producer and director that we have on board. And then the next one uh, is The Secret, uh, who is produced by Zane uh, under Revolution Media, uh, directed by Jason Chong. And then we have uh, season two of From Saga With Love, uh, who is now in, in development, still in script stage. Uh, we maintain the producer, of course, the producer and creator, which is Lina Tan, under Red Communications. And of, of course, we maintain the head writer, uh, the director of the show, which is Rafida and also Umi Sawana. Yeah, we're looking forward to all of that because so much of buzz being created around these shows. Uh, yeah. So now coming to the end of the show, and I always ask this from all our guests, what are the five great content pieces you watched last year? <laughs> this is the hardest question to answer. Outside of you, huh? <laughs> that's the thing. This yeah, is the hardest question to answer. Uh, you go first. Then I can well, feel I'm actually unfortunately just um, we have very little time. I have I have very little time. Um I don't even know I can do five. Well, I watch Abang Ade. Uh, um. and I, I watch Abang Ade. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. Um, I watch Andor. Uh, I've just personally, because I've always been looked as I've aged up, you know, I've felt like the Star Wars franchise has, it, it's still primarily targeted to a much younger audience. And I think Andor was really like one, was of really the, one of the few, right? They felt, okay, this works for an old fogey like me. Um, I'm sure there have been a couple, you know, but I'm actually re just revisiting some classics with my kids. Uh, so Avatar, The Last Airbender. Oh, wow. uh, the, the cartoon. Oh, not, okay. Not, not right? that. Avatar, The Last Airbender. The, the original cartoon and Legend of Korra. Oh, lovely. All right. uh, so I, I actually watch a lot of animation. See, So I would say, yeah, those are the ones. I'm working through those again with my kids. I've seen them obviously before. Now it's introducing them. They're revisiting uh, all of to, them. To my kids. <laughs> what did you watch? <laughs> yeah, the latest one was Abang Ade. We watched together with our team uh, at the cinema recently. That was last week. Yeah, was last right. Week. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I watched Fool Me Once. That was last weekend. What else? <laughs> uh, well, the days we're... and weeks are a blur. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're still in January, so I don't know why. Uh, last Christmas, I decided to watch a lot of Christmas movies. You you, you went on to the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I I watch a lot of Christmas movies. All uh, those are all movies. I, I don't have time to watch a uh, series. And then I I think at that time I was just decided to do. I mean, I was on leave at that at, on that week, right? So I just decided to to make myself, to entertain myself. And I was like, okay, don't watch all these serious yeah. drama, serious <laughs> movies and whatnot. Those dark thrillers, right? Let's just go for fun. Okay, let's watch Christmas movies. That's what Year End is all about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, guys, for, for coming in and spending us. time. It was, it was a great insight into view yeah. and what all you guys have been working on. And thanks again for taking time out for what's doing and... Hope to do this again sometime in the new future sure. when sure. things are going to be different. New new content pieces yeah. are going to be done from your side and we'll meet again. Okay. Thank, Thank, you Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Their work is a clear indicator of the high bar set for the future of local content. Their innovative approach and dedication to quality storytelling set new standards in the Malaysian creative industry. It's an exciting time for local content creators and View Malaysia is undoubtedly leading the way. I'm Abid and this has been What's Doing. Till next time, keep stewing. Mm -hmm.